Um, shall we wait a few more minutes? Yeah, let's give it one more minute to let people come in. I see we've still got people coming in right now. Yeah, so we'll give a moment for everyone to come in. Hello, Roberto. Everything's fine? Yeah, I can. Uh, for those who are joining, uh, please introduce yourselves in the um, in the chat and where you're from. And I would also like to flag that we have interpretation available as well in Spanish and Portuguese. So if you go to the interpretation button at the bottom and choose the language that you'd like to listen in, um, that is available as well. Okay, I think we can start. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Promoting Playful Parenting Through Remote model Modalities, Sharing Evidence, Challenges, and Opportunities. We're, thr we're thrilled to have all of you here today to hear about the latest evidence and resources to support and guide policymakers, practitioners, and researchers working in the field of parent and caregiver support across sectors and across the life course. And of course, a very warm welcome to our presenters this morning. My name is Elizabeth Lule, and I'm the Executive Director of the Early Childhood Development Action Network. And I'm also representing the Global Initiative um, to support uh, parents, and as we call it, uh, guests. Uh, so GISP was initiated during the COVID-19 pandemic by UNICEF, WHO, ECDAN, the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, and the University uh, of Oxford. And during that time, with in-person services difficult or impossible to access for many parents and caregivers, uh, more and more attention turned to remote, digital, and hybrid modalities for reaching families that needed support. And I think all parents and children were experiencing um, challenges, um, balancing work and other responsibilities and with childcare uh, centers and schools closed. And now in 2023, uh, the immediate impacts of COVID-19 are less urgent, but the lessons we learned during that time are invaluable. Today, we are pleased to feature new evidence, tools, and lessons learned from implementing remote and other parenting support programs. We are also happy to feature experiences from multiple countries in implementing these programs, including Romania, Brazil, and Ethiopia, so across the world. Um, I will now hand over to uh, our moderator um, and in, uh, who will introduce the first speakers. Uh, to my colleague, Amando Germanio. Over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. We're very excited to have everyone involved um, and to be here attending to listen to all the great speakers and panelists that we have included here today. Um, I am going to go ahead and start with a short introduction on the Global Initiative to Support Parents, which as Elizabeth mentioned, um, is one of the organizers of today's webinar. Um, so uh, I'm the global coordinator for the Global Initiative to Support Parents, which is an interagency consortium consisting of ECDAN, the UNICEF, the World Health Organization, and Violence Against Children, and Parenting for Lifelong Health. I'm going to start by just giving you a brief introduction on why we're all here today. So why do we support parenting support interventions and what is the value of parenting support interventions? So first of all, parenting support interventions work across a broad range of sectors and across the life course. So this combines outcomes from early childhood, from adolescence, from middle childhood, and across a broad range of sectors, including violence prevention, child protection, ECD, mental health, health, nutrition, and other sectors. Um, but a lot of these parenting support initiatives and programs are frequently siloed across different sectors which may make it difficult for actors to, um, to collaborate and to scale evidence-based programs. 
All of this work builds on existing frameworks. So we already have a lot of evidence that has been distilled into different toolkits and resources that are available, but none of them have been combined before. So we have the Nurturing Care Framework, we have Inspire, we have different evidence-based programs that um, have been tested and have been shown to be effective, but no one, one place that combines them and no, uh, no place to access them together. And we know that uh, parenting support initiatives take place uh, across a broad range of, um, of ways of providing support for parents and caregivers. So we have, for example, parenting resources that are um, reach the entire population that can be disseminated through radio, through television presentations or newspaper. We also have services that can be integrated into routine services. And then we also have more intensive services that can be family or group based or can include digital outreach or intensive interventions. And this is part of what we're talking about today is some of these remote hybrid and digital modalities to reach parents and caregivers. So with all of this in mind, why am I here talking to you today, today about the global initiative to support parents? Um, and that is because in spite of all the evidence we have around parenting support initiatives, there's still a huge need to reach parents and caregivers around the world. Only 26% of governments say they're reaching all parents who need it. And as we can see, despite all the strong evidence, interventions are frequently siloed. And recent uh, events such as the COVID-19 pandemic have really unveiled um, that parents really are frontline workers, but that when uh, accesses to services are reduced, it can lead to a global parenting crisis. So with this in mind, the Global Initiative to Support Parents uh, was initiated by the five agencies you see below, FDAN, the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, World Health Organization, UNICEF, and Parenting for Lifelong Health to enable all parents and caregivers to access quality and evidence parenting support initiatives according to their need. So GISP, as we call it, works across four pillars to advocate for additional investments for parents, to generate evidence and share that knowledge around parent and caregiver support, to innovate around parent supporting parents, and to scale evidence-based programs um, based on the following criteria, whether they show evidence of impact or low cost and non-commercial, are open source and adaptive, scalable and sustainable, and whether they foster policy partnerships. So with this in mind, we're very excited today to have this webinar to share some of the new and emerging evidence around digital and remote modalities for supporting parents and caregivers. Um, we have some great presentations ahead of us and I'm eager to turn over to our panelists so we can actually hear from them. Um, but very quickly before I do that, I just wanted to share how you can get involved with GISP because GISP is more than just the five agencies included um, on the logos there. It's everyone. We want to create a global movement around parenting. Um, so we do have a global parenting town hall that we're planning for later in the month and we'll include links for that. We also encourage you to stay engaged with GISP and with our partners who work in parenting caregiver support by signing up for the newsletter or by collaborating with us on future webinars. We're also planning a global parenting forum for next year, and we'll keep everyone who's interested updated on progress, as well as plans to launch a website later this month or later uh, next month. So, without much further ado, I will go ahead and turn over to um, our first speakers, who are from Child Fund. Um, and apologies, I'll stop sharing my screen here. So I would like to, um, as I mentioned, introduce our first speakers from Child Fund. So we have with us for today, um, Sandra Santoval Chifuentes, who is going to be introducing the program from Child Fund. She is um, Senior ECD Advisor for Child Fund. Um, her colleagues, Darcy Strauss, our Director of Research and Learning with Child Fund International. Uh, Sofia Rebeje, Project Manager of Child Fund International in Brazil. And Natan Tillahun, who is a Project Manager for Child Fund International in Ethiopia. Um, I don't want to take up too much additional time, so I'll just go over and hand over to our first speaker, Sandra, to introduce the program. Thank you very much, Amanda. Just confirming if we have the PPT. And I will go ahead and follow the
Great, thank you very much. Uh, we are very thrilled to share uh, some evidence, learnings, and experiences from the project Come Play With Me. This was a multi-country project. If we, if we can continue. And to start, we just want to share a, a little bit about Child Fund. Child Fund is an international organization that for now we are covering more than 16.2 million of children and their families in 24 countries throughout Asia, Africa, and the Americas. We believe that when children's needs are met, they can do what children do best, play, learn, and grow into the people they dream of becoming. Next slide. We have been engaged um, in Lego Foundation projects related to playful parenting since 2019. We started with an initial project called Come Play With Me in Guatemala. And uh, the purpose for this project was to combine uh, group sessions methodology with home visits based in a previous experience that Telephone Guatemala developed in collaboration with the, with the collaboration of the World Bank. And uh, as you all know, then the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic began. And because of that, we had to switch the modality due to the restrictions to have to hold the group meetings and the home visits. So we created a radio theater that we called We Play and Learn as a Family, initially with five spots where we were addressing the main concerns of the caregivers that uh, we were covering previously or we were that were participating previously in the Come Play With Me project. And uh, with that five spots, we could also uh, increase the number by another project that was named Playful Parenting in Guatemala despite COVID-19, where we combined uh, the radio theater with uh, storybooks, text messages, and some uh, cash transfers or food baskets for the the most affected families in Guatemala. Uh, also, we during this project we increased the number of, of spots of the of the radio theater from five to thirty, and uh, the initial five were talking about the specific the COVID the pandemic of the COVID nineteen the prevention measures. But after this, we created five spots on nurturing care and five spots on cognitive development, language motor and social emotional respectively. With that experience that uh, we found that was very useful because uh, many of the rural, in, the, in many of the rural communities in Guatemala, there was no access to internet or to social platforms or another gadgets. Uh, we found that the radio was still very relevant for these communities. And we had the opportunity as telephone to make the first replication in Mexico. So uh, in July, 2021, the Telfon Mexico began the adaptation and contextualization of the radio theater for uh, some indigenous communities as well. Then in December, 2021, the original project Come Play With Me it made an amendment and they changed the original design to a remote, only remote modality with radio programs that last 20 minutes approximately. And finally, in March 2022, we start the another replication of the same project design in four countries, which are Honduras, Brazil, Ethiopia, and Uganda. And the findings and some of the evidence of this last replication is what we are going to share. Okay. Uh, so this project is called uh, Playful Parenting During COVID, Expanding Playful Learning Strategies in Brazil, Ethiopia, Honduras, and Uganda. I think it's the next slide, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, in this project, we have five activities. The first activity is related with use of uh, technologies, mod traditional or modern technologies to send playful messages to, the, to caregivers. The second activity is related to engage with peer networks to talk about positive relationships between caregivers and their children. In the third activity, we educate communities and, and facilitators on how to support caregivers to foster playful parenting. And in this project, the addition is that we included social emotional learning. The activity four is related to develop a educational, playful, and informative messages about COVID-19. 
And finally, the activity number five was related to how can we engage with the ministries of health or social protection or education to uh, provide and to work together, reaching more caregivers or more, uh, for instance, some uh, hard to reach regions through these modalities and how they can adopt this uh, content and this radio theater uh, to their programs. And uh, the last, and um, from my end, uh, next, next slide, I just would like to mention what is the reach of this project. Uh, as I mentioned before, this project is implemented in four countries and we, we reached uh, 51,000 uh, uh, children, 31,000, more than 31,000 parents, 1,700 volunteers, uh, the number of teachers and facilitators, 1,252. And uh, finally, 945 uh, members of the government uh, ministries or secretariats and uh, 32 local partners, which are uh, our uh, implementers uh, in, the, in the countries. And uh, they are, these are so civil society organizations who are from the regions and that they are they speak the same language, they share the same culture, and they are very relevant for the implementation of projects. So this is what I would like to share. This is the, the brief introduction of Child Fund and the project. And now my colleague Darcy is going to share about the evidence that we have from this project. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. We are very, very excited to share some preliminary evidence. I'm really calling this preliminary because we're still reflecting on the evidence um, ourselves internally, both at the project level and also at the organizational level. And we're gonna be sharing evidence from two of the four countries that Sandra mentioned are, that are part of this multi-country project, Ethiopia and Brazil. And I do wanna start by saying, although I'm sharing um, this preliminary evidence, um, the evidence is really the fact that we have this evidence that we're sharing today is really the result of not only you know our local partners who are implementing the programs on the ground in the four countries, but also our entire outcome evaluation study team. And and I note them here, and um, particularly the leadership of Sharifa Moabju, um, who is our lead male advisor. So move to, moving to the next slide. We wanted to start by sharing with you that we actually have three project evaluation components. The first one on the left is a process evaluation, which we're using to inform the outcome evaluation and some of the results that you're going to be seeing today. It's very, very important and involves implementation tracking tools and a whole process of reflection and learning. And that's one of the reasons why we're here today. So that's very much in place as I said, not the focus today, but we do use those results to interpret the evidence that's coming out of the second part that you see here. So I'll, we'll be focusing today, myself and my colleague Sophia, on this middle part, the outcome evaluation, and then the most, the application of the most significant change approach. That's the third part. So both of these with the orange circles, we're, we'll be sharing on today to share the, our evidence and impact. So in terms of the outcome evaluation, we wrapped a 12-week study around the project where we implemented a pre and post baseline and end line knowledge attitudes and practice survey. Um, the focus of this was to be very, very intensive to be collecting data, you know, looking at a, very, a short time period of implementation, very, very focused where we were delivering the, the intervention. And you'll hear more about the study groups that we have in each of the countries. And the focus very much of this 12 weeks sort of study um, was on the focus of the contribution of the remote, the radio delivery, which is a really, really the innovative piece of this multi-country project. Most significant change, we use this to get at a more qualitative look at our impact. Um, those of you familiar with most significant change, it uses participatory research to generate impact stories. And you're really able to look at what the impact of the project from a caregiver perspective or another key stakeholder perspective, looking at the who, what, why, where, and how of the change. So you're gonna hear these two pieces, quantitative evidence, and then the qualitative most significant change stories from Brazil today. Next slide. So here we're, we were showing you sort of just a really um, big overview of the methods for the outcome evaluation. As I just mentioned, this was to generate our quantitative data. On the left side, you see the outcomes that we were looking at. These are the outcomes that were generated using the knowledge attitude and practice survey. So we have sort of four key areas of outcomes that we're looking at, early stimulation practice. And here we're using four more early stimulation practices based on 
the multi-indicator cluster survey mix six, the questionnaire um, focused on children under five. This is a very common outcome to be used to look at early stimulation. And that's where there's, there'll be, you'll see very soon and in, in then one of the next slides where we're looking at the outcomes, six key activities, parent-child interaction um, around sort of um, early stimulation. And we're looking at four of those six um, being, being implemented by the caregiver. ECD knowledge, we have a set of individual questions. You see them here, focusing on when children start to learn, who's their first teacher, um, what's the best way for a young child to learn. And then we also did a composite, um, whether or not they, they were able to get all three of those questions correct. So that's what we're looking at in terms of ECD knowledge, early child development knowledge. And then we also um, look at a knowledge question about child discipline, whether or not punishment leads to better outcomes for children. And finally, we're going to we were going to share so one knowledge outcome that we had. We did ask a small set of COVID nineteen questions, on uh, and we're going to share one of whether nursing during COVID nineteen is appropriate. So their knowledge of that question and all of this was these were all important components of the messaging that was done via the the radio the radio theater. And then when when we used hybrid modes, there were other other intervention um, activities that were used to to promote this content um, learning. A very important piece that I want to mention of our CAP survey is that we really intended it to be short, really focus on you know the type, the data that we were going to use. So the whole less less is more sort of approach, and that we really were um, using very very little burden on the respondents. So very short surveys, baseline and endline, endline just a little bit longer. One additional um, very important survey item for us was a question on endline about which come play with me program activities did they participate in? And you're gonna see how we use that to really generate our design for the, for the analyses and the overall study. On the right-hand side, you see our analysis approach. We um, tried to be as robust as we could with our analyses. Um, we, we used logistic regression um, with cluster standard errors, and we either did that at the village level or the local partner level. We used the difference in difference approach um, for the knowledge outcomes that really, and this al allowed us to apply sort of a quasi-experimental design where we actually have, we have a comparison group that we can compare the results um, to for both a hybrid group and a remote group, you'll see based on the country context. And then we use propensity score weighting, very, very important to sort of control and to balance on baseline imbalances. We did that both when regressing on the knowledge outcomes, and you see here some of those balanced um, variables that we use, and then also when regressing on early stimulation practices. So this is sort of wrapping a control around so we can control as much bias as possible um, in our analyses. Next slide. So now we're gonna take a look at our preliminary findings from Ethiopia, next slide. And I'm gonna, first I wanted to start just with giving you, this is very, very important to sort of interpreting and looking at, at the results you're gonna see, the evidence that we're generating out of this, out of this project. We wanna look at the implementation context. We're gonna do it for both countries. So starting with Ethiopia, the first part of the context that, that we wanna focus on is what other exposure, and this is very important when conducting you know, outcome evaluations in both development and humanitarian settings, there could be other activities that your populations have been exposed to. Um, Child Fund, we have other programs in some of these areas where we're delivering this project, and there may be, sometimes there may be other organizations present, or, the na or at a national level, there may be a, a national-wide sort of ECD program. So we know that there may be some other exposure there. So we want to look very carefully at it. In the case of Ethiopia, little known influence by other, other program activities, either by Child Fund or by other organizations. And the radio broadcasting, very important here, is a very unique standalone feature. In terms of the intervention variable that we're looking at in Ethiopia, we have we have participants, so people with no direct exposure. So we have a no, no exposure group. You see that on the right-hand side. Um, and then we're looking at, this is sort of based on as treated from that, that, that survey item I mentioned to you before when we asked what, what, what project activities were they exposed to. Then what we did in Ethiopia is we did do so pre-assignment to groups. So we had people that were um, assigned to a remote delivery and here they, that was radio broadcasting using seven radio stations. So that's the remote, that's the remote group. So it's remote only. And then we have a group of participants that are in hybrid where they had, they received in-person parenting sessions and then also the radio broadcasting using those seven radio stations. So that's a hybrid. So those are our three study groups for Ethiopia. Next slide. 
And here you see some of the preliminary findings. You see the distribution of program modality um, by modality. Looking at that, using that, that survey item that I just mentioned that asked them what activities that they participated in. And here you see there's some level of mixture in the remote delivery group with the in-person, but you see that the, this, the purple bar, 82%, that's in the remote, they're receiving the, the radio delivery. And then in the hybrid, 56%. So you can see sort of the distribution across other different, different activities that were delivered by the program. And you'll see this in Brazil as well. Megaphones were used, um, WhatsApp was used to message content. So there was some other remote delivery um, as well as in-person delivery community fairs, both the hybrid and the remote group received those. So you see here that, that distribution of, by, of activities by modality. Next slide. So here we're going to start to look at the results and you'll see for each of the knowledge results you'll see um, this type of graph um, portrayed um, and then a little bit of summary of the results. So this is for when do children start to learn. The correct answer is from before birth and you see on the graph the probability of correct correctly answering the question and here you'll see um, highlighted in orange we had some very nice significant results both at change over time but what we're really going to focus on across all of these results really is the difference in the change over time and that's where we were able to compare hybrid the hybrid group to the no exposure group and the remote group to the no exposure group and here you see that we had a significant finding um, for the hybrid versus no exposure, and then an, a finding for remote versus no exposure that was sort of approaching significance. And you can see the blue line in the graph is a no exposure. And then you can see that the hybrid is the, is the, the red line up on top. And you can see that difference, it's 37 percentage points. And then you can also see the difference between the remote and the no exposure. So there definitely was, was an effect here um, in comparison to that no exposure group for both of the study, the two study intervention groups. Next slide. Um, next slide. So now, now we're looking at the result for what is the best way for young children to learn. Very important question for this project, and the answer, correct answer is through play. Here, too, you see that we have some significant results, both at just looking at change over time from time one to time two, but you also see that, that we have um, a, a significant, significant results looking at the comparison of the groups. So the hybrid to no exposure, significant again, and then remote to no exposure is also is approaching significance. So very, very important um, results for us. Next slide. And now we're looking at the probability of answering all three of those knowledge questions correctly. And you see that we don't, we, we have some change over time significant effects. So for both hybrid and remote, but we don't see any significant effects for the change, the difference in the change over time. So either for the hybrid or the remote, but we did for the, for the individual. Next slide. So now we're looking at that child discipline question that we have. So the question is, do children who are disciplined with spanking and punishments grow up to be more obedient and polite than those who are not? So the correct answer is no. And you see, this is one where, you know, at baseline more are saying yes. And the, the hope is that they're that at, at end line less are saying yes and they're actually answering with no. And you see here we do have a significant result, both in change over time, but even more importantly, when we compare the groups. So hybrid to no, ex no exposure, 33 percentage point difference going the right way, and remote versus no exposure, also a significant result. So so both of those for both of those study groups, whether they're in the hybrid or remote, there is a significant effect on this knowledge question. Next slide. And our last knowledge question. So this is the COVID question that I mentioned earlier, um, a very important one. This is one we had other, um, we asked some other questions about COVID knowledge. So the just standard sort of questions about social distancing, but this is the one item we found that was really novel to our content messaging, something very important that they may not have heard through other messaging about COVID. So should a mother with COVID-19 still nurse her child age zero to six months old? The correct answer is yes. And you see here, we see some change over time, significant results, but we also see a significant result for the remote. So that radio theater, theater delivery of messaging around this, this particular knowledge area for COVID-19, significantly more people in the remote group got this correct versus a no exposure. So a very important knowledge, knowledge outcome for, for the COVID-19 messaging. Next slide. So here we look at our effect on practice. This is using, as I said, the mixed survey item 
four or more of the six activities. You see them here in the green shaded box. Um, the activities reading books, telling stories to your child, singing songs, taking them outside the home, playing with the child, and then naming or counting or drawing things. So those six. So they had to have engaged in four of the six. And you see here, we see a significant result for the remote. So the remote result is on the right. The hybrid is on the left of this graph. And we see that they're prob probably engaging in four or more of those six activities is significantly higher for the remote group versus the no exposure group. And this is by about 25 percentage points, which you can see right where that circle is on the, the graph on the blue line on the right. So a very, very exciting result related to practice for Ethiopia. Next slide. So now we're gonna go into look at the results um, for Brazil. So next slide. So once again, once again, that we are, we are going to be looking first at the implement, implementation context. So Brazil is different than Ethiopia. Here in terms of exposure, there were other local ECD initiatives by partners. So we're already looking at a, at a group of, of program participants who most likely have received some type of other ECD content messaging. The radio broadcasting, however, was still a very unique standalone feature, something that they had not received before, but, but there was other exposure to ECD initiatives. So here, in terms of how we created our study groups, we used sort of an as-treated model using that, that, that variable that we, that we mentioned earlier about the program activities that they participated in. So we have people with no direct exposure to come play with me once again. There still may have been some exposure to local and national ECD initiatives, but that's our no exposure group. We then have people with exposure to the radio broadcasting. So we took the very unique feature, what makes come play with me, come play with me, that, that radio delivery, and there's, that's the Radio Plus group. And then there were people with no exposure to radio broadcasting, but, but exposure to some other ECD messaging. That's the No Radio Plus. So we have Radio Plus, No Radio Plus, and then a No Exposure group for Brazil. Next slide. So here you see for Brazil, the program activities by modality. And what you see here is other than the radio theater, um, which you see very distinctly 83% in the Radio Plus, the distribution of the program activities, they look, it looks very similar between the two groups. Um, and one except community fairs, you know, 49% in Radio Plus, 48% in no radio. So sort of, if you look very similar distributions across the different mo modalities. Next slide. So here, starting to look at the results by the knowledge question. So when do children start to learn? Our first knowledge question from before birth, you see here that there's a change over time result for the no radio group, but no other significant differences in terms of looking at the, the study groups versus the no exposure group. Next slide. Also here for the second knowledge question, who's your child's first teacher? This is the caregiver. Also here, we don't see, we see some change over time results, but we don't see, we don't see any significant results with, when we do the group comparison. Next slide. Same thing for what is the best way for your child to learn. Also, we don't see, we see some change over time results for the radio and no radio group, group and you can see them in the, in the graph here, but no, no differences by the study groups comparing to the no exposure group. Next slide. But what we do see here, which we didn't see in Ethiopia, is when we look at the composite getting all three of those ECD knowledge questions correct, the probability of that, we do see an effect um, when we compare the groups. So for the Radio Plus group, there's a borderline approaching significance effect, but for the no Radio Plus group, we see a significant effect by 15 percentage points. So you see that, that here in the graph. So composite question, all three correct, is a significant effect for Brazil. Next slide. Here's the discipline question. So looking at that here, we, we do see change over time, significant results, but we don't see any differences by, by the, um, the study groups versus the comparison group, the no exposure group. Next slide. And the COVID question. So here for about nursing their children, here we see a change over time effect for, for radio. And we also see for the Radio Plus group, we see there's a significant difference on the positive side that Radio Plus group, 
more likely to get this question correct versus the no exposure group. So another important finding for, for radio remote delivery with messaging about this, this particular COVID content area. Next slide. And then here, finally, we have the practice outcomes. So four more early stim stimulation activities, um, engaging in those, we see no effect here for, for, for Brazil, um, but we did see that effect from Ethiopia. So you see that neither for, for the no radio or for the radio plus group, there's not a significant effect. So next slide. So what we wanted to do now, so you've seen us run through the same set of outcomes for both Ethiopia and Brazil. And there's some overlap, but there really are some very different findings. But as we share, there's very different perspective in terms of exposure. So we wanted to put sort of our evidence recap side by side here. So starting with e Ethiopia and looking at those knowledge questions, we saw significant effects of both being, being participating in the hybrid and the remote, the remote intervention groups. We saw significant positive effects on each of those each of these knowledge questions. So when children start to learn, who's the child's first teacher, um, the best way for the child to learn through play, and whether punishment leads to better outcomes. In contrast, in Brazil, we didn't see positive effects necessarily for the individual questions, but we did went in the composite. So they were more likely to get all three correct. So an interesting difference in the knowledge outcome finding across the, the two contexts. In terms of the knowledge about the COVID-19 so question about when to when to breast when is it appropriate to breastfeed? We see the same the same result. Really, the the remote delivery in Ethiopia, the radio group in Brazil, both were more participants in those groups. Both were more more likely to get that correct. So the similar result across for the COVID-19 infection question. In terms of practice, we saw we saw a significant effect in Ethiopia. Um, with a remote, remote delivery group practicing more early stimulation activities at end line versus the no exposure group, but we had no, no effect um, in Brazil. And then a final note here about Ethiopia. When we also analyze, so we analyze sort of as assigned in Ethiopia, but if we also analyze sort of as treated using that, that variable about program activities, we get near identical results. And this really sort of, we think, sort of points to the robustness of the results that we're seeing in Ethiopia, which is very, very exciting. Next slide. So we wanted to sort of end sort of the, this presentation of our quantitative evidence with just, you know, a small set of sort of key points about what we think we're learning about our evidence. Um, so summarized here, the first point is that that delivery context, you know, what they've already been exposed to is so very important um, for the design and sort of be able to apply, if you want to apply sort of quasi-experimental design to it for analysis and the methods that you pick and how we, how we actually analyze the data and for the interpretation of results. So very, very, very critical for that. Um, we really are finding that the knowledge enhancement findings are very promising. Um, the study that we've wrapped around really that with a sort of a quasi-experimental approach really lets us get to sort of that promising level of evidence when we have positive findings and, and our knowledge findings really are promising. We're also seeing, particularly you saw it in Ethiopia, some very promising results for practice. But we do know that 12 weeks is a short time frame for practice change. But the fact that we're seeing these positive results um, from the radio delivery from remote delivery is very, very exciting. It also may mean too that, you know, when we look at Brazil that, you know, maybe there's more repeated messaging. Maybe there's some, you know, some design tweaks that we need to make, maybe more practice that may be very important for sustainable practice change. So it's something that, that we need to look at more carefully and will be exciting as we look at the results that we're gonna get from Honduras and Uganda, which are gonna be two additionally different exposure contexts. Um, the fourth point here is we think a lot about, you know, what do we do next in terms of evaluation? So future evaluations of the Come Play With Me project, we really believe we need to include multiple measures of early stimulation. We had one here, and we also need to assess child level outcomes, um, which, which we haven't done yet. So very important. And another piece that's very important, and we talk a lot about this internally, is we need to do more, a, a, more, a formal cost study, which we, have, which we have not done. And the last point here is, um, and this is very important, and we're very excited that we were able to integrate this into the evaluation of this program, is the importance of multi-method evaluation, um, using both the quantitative and the qualitative to understand contributions and impact. And a very important piece of this is the most significant change stories. You're gonna find that they're rich and informative 
And you're gonna hear this next. And so I'm gonna be passing to my colleague, Sofia Rebe from Brazil to share Brazil's stories and how we use the most significant change approach. But really both you'll see, um, they really inform each other and they, they, they complement each other. So, and with that, um, I'm gonna, next slide. And I'm going to hand off to Sofia, who's gonna share um, our experience using the most significant change approach in Brazil. Thank you, Darcy. And before Sophia starts, I just wanted to flag, you can feel free to continue to put your questions in the chat. And for our presenters as well, there's a, several questions there. If you'd like to take a look and start to answer some of them. Thanks. Sophia? Hello, everyone. So uh, my name is Sophia. I'm the project manager of this project, Come Play With Me, here in Brazil. And as part of this project uh, here in Brazil, we had the participation of more than 12,000 children and 6,000 caregivers. And to get to know uh, the change that we were able to promote with this project, we did a qualitative evaluation using uh, the methodology Most Significant Change, uh, which involves a participatory approach to collect and select life-changing stories generated from uh, an interve intervention. Uh, so for that, we hired a consultancy firm so that we could have an independent analysis of this qualitative aspect. And we had uh, these two main objectives, which were uh, to collect the impacts of the intervention on caregivers and children, and also to capture lessons learned on remote and hybrid modalities in playful parenting interventions. Next one, please. So after a documented uh, a document analysis to understand the project, the field work was carried out uh, in person in two municipalities in each of the two states of Brazil that uh, were participating in the project. And for each one of these states, we selected a rural and a urban uh, municipality. And so the field work started with a focus, uh, some focus group discussions we had uh, 57 people participating, uh, mostly women. And then the participants uh, of this group uh, uh, who shared most meaningful statements uh, following a set of determined criteria were selected to participate in a second stage of data collection, uh, which consisted in individual uh, interviews. And so for we had 15 people's, uh, people interviewed in this stage two. And for that, for that 15 people, we selected 12 uh, to be transformed in these stories of change. In, in addition to the focus groups and interviews, uh, we have also had informal conversations with five children uh, three girls and two boys, and it was not uh, part of the initial plan of this consultancy, and it was only to illustrate the, the work. So uh, next one, please. Okay, so, so then based on a preliminary analysis of these 12 stories of change, uh, here at Child Fund, uh, we selected six of them to be subject, uh, subjected to a participatory selection. And for that, we realized it, we, do, we did two workshops uh, remotely. The first one with the members of the project team of Child Fund Brazil and local partner organizations who are in charge of the implementation in these 37 uh, municipalities uh, of Brazil. And then a second round of workshop with members of Child Fund International. Um, and the same list of criteria that were used to design the focus groups and interviews forms uh, have, has helped in the selection of the stories in the workshop with these two groups. And this, uh, these are the criterias. So we had uh, personal change, changing the child, changing the family, child seen as a right holder, holders, understanding of the project, application of project practice, and changing the family routine. And yeah, so we were supposed to select three stories of change, but we selected a fourth one. 
Uh, and we decided to do that because it was a testimony of a, a male caregiver. And yeah, the, the decision was made because we need to involve male caregivers, right, in promoting child development. And due to the, to, to the low level of attendance of fathers and male caregivers in the project activities, it also uh, was reflected in the evaluation process. So it was important to include this one um, as an example as well. Yes, so going to the next one, thank you. Uh, here I, I, we have a, an example of the, the, the other one. The... Can you move back to the, uh, yes, thank you. So here is an example of the, one of the, the stories that were selected, the awakening of imagination. So just to show you a little bit of uh, uh, the testimonial of this mother, uh, regarding to the criteria that we, we had defined in the beginning of the, the evaluation. So for like for personal change, we, we have this part of this testimonial. I was a very aggressive mother, no patient to talk, to be able to teach. Everything was brutal. I even ended up slapping at times. Because you don't have the patient, you slap, you punish in the wrong way. And with the project, I've been opening my mind about that. I, I'm, I'm not going to read everything, but just to show that uh, even when we look to the different stories of the different countries that are part of this Muchi project, um, Muchi country project, and it's, it is interesting to, to notice that uh, these caregivers, they, they are open to, be, to, to change the way they can, can uh, promote child development, looking at their own childhood and from that, doing things different with their own child, right? So um, we observe that the, the, the testimonial shows show that they, they they are kind of honest themselves. They they see themselves as vulnerable and put themselves in a in a context that I want to do different. That uh, the, the 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 type of the model of childhood that I had myself. So this is very interesting to notice. And here uh, on the right side, uh, for for this mother, we also have uh, uh, a small testimonial of the daughter. And it's, it, it goes in the same way. Uh, so I, look, I like a lot to play with my puppet that I make with my mom. Her name is Aurora. What I like most about playing with my mom is to play in the bathroom and singing songs. We, we read every day. There are times when mom and, ma, and, ma and I make a story of everything we have around us. And I love doing that. My, my dad also plays a lot with with me, so this is a family um, that mostly the, the mother participate on the in the project. The father didn't have enough time with the work, but also the the, the children here, the child. She she mentioned that the dad also plays a lot with her. And when I do something wrong, my mom just talks to me, and my dad too. They just talk. So it's a, a good testimony to 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 bring to you. And the last one, please. And yeah, thanks, Sophia. We could wrap up quickly to make sure we have enough time for the other speakers as well. Yeah, and here's just some of the findings. So it was very uh, effective to use uh, WhatsApp here in Brazil. This is one of the, the digital tools, tools most utilized uh, in Brazil last year. And and yeah, about information about COVID as well. It was very useful. And uh, I just want you to, to present here the, the final part of the rights in the right side, that uh, the repetition of simple tips prove it to be an excellent strategy for retaining the content. And so we use it in, in all of the content at the end, we we had this this mention. Have you already said to your child you 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 love your child today? And this is something that uh, a lot of mothers that participate in this evaluation process uh, came back and say, "Oh, it was so important for me to remember that and and say it to my child every day." So thank you. I, I guess I don't have enough time to show the other things, but okay. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia.
Um, and I'll hand over to Natan as well now. And Natan, if you could go through um, kind of quickly to make sure we have enough time for questions and answers. And Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Amanda. Now I'll uh, briefly go over some of the activities that we've been uh, conducting in Ethiopia as part of this project. Mm -hmm. In Ethiopia, the project was being implemented by uh, 13 local implementing partners. As uh, Sandra mentioned at the beginning of uh, the presentation, uh, the implementing partners are uh, community-based organizations. And in Ethiopia, we work with uh, uh, the 13 implementing partners in four regions. And this project was being uh, implemented in this uh, in this areas. Um, next slide, please. So uh, as uh, you heard from the previous presentations as well, we had um, two major project implementation modalities. One was an in-person meeting of parents by, in the case of Ethiopia, by using listenership sessions whereby parents listen to a recorded radio messages. Um, and as a result, our initial uh, goal was to reach about 6,000 parents and about 5,000 children, whereby parents engage in uh, the listenership sessions. And uh, when they go home to their children, they engage with their children in playful activities. And as a result, we were able to um, you know, reach you know, more than 400% from our initial goal uh, in terms of the number of children that we were able to reach, whereby parents were engaged with their children, and more than 180% in terms of uh, engaging uh, parents in in-person activities. And next slide, please. And um, our other implementation modality was utilizing um, radio spots, which were uh, translated into four uh, local languages, Amharic, Afano, Romo, Kistaninya, and Gedio. And these were broadcasted in seven radio stations and in the operational areas that Child Fund Ethiopia was uh, conducting and is conducting in activities, we were able to reach more than 1 million uh, population residing in the target areas. Uh, next slide, please. And an, another interesting aspect of, of this project was that although uh, the project was phased out, the local implementing partners were uh, very much interested in, in, in the project activities, that they continue their, um, their uh, modalities of uh, reaching parents by using recorded radio messaging um, and parenting activities, and they were able to reach uh, a, a number of uh, children, you know, whereby the children were engaged with their parents in playful activities. Parents and caregivers, uh, which were reached uh, you know, after after the project activities ended, and another key component of this project was also to engage um, local community stakeholders, uh, local uh, media stations, and also government stakeholders, uh, so that they incorporate you know so the parenting activities, in-person activities into their ongoing um, uh, parenting activities, and so uh, they were able to engage with them afterwards. In addition, the local implementing partners. Uh, utilized you know their own resources in terms of money uh, be it by uh, buying airtime from radio stations or negotiating for you no know, lesser amount of airtime for uh, broadcasting the radio spots and as a result uh, they are currently continuing to um, you know sustain their activities um, you know to kind of briefly go over some of the project activities uh, you will be watching a short video of the project that has been implemented in in Ethiopia uh, I think we can watch the video now. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know if we have time for the video right now with the other speakers, but we will definitely circulate it after the webinar and share it with the recording as well. And if there's time at the end, perhaps we can share it. We can show it at the end as well. But I want to make sure we have enough time for Q&A as well. So there's a lot of questions. In the Great. Um, thanks, everyone. We'll be sure to circulate that video. And I would like to, uh, first of all, thank all of our speakers from Child Fund for that very interesting presentation. There's a lot of questions in the chat um, and a lot of Q&A. So I know there's a lot of discussion and questions there, which we will hopefully have time to get to. I'm going to introduce our next speaker now, um, who is Carmen Laika, who is the director of the Step-by-Step uh, -step Center for Education and Professional Development in Romania. Um, thank you, Carmen. We're going to go ahead and put up your presentation now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Step-by-Step -step Center 
um, for Education and Professional Development. It's a non-governmental organization in Romania established in 1998, uh, which implements the step-by-step uh, -step educational alternative in early childhood um, and primary and low secondary school in um, the public educational system in Romania. And also, um, has um, a lot of activities being the lead organization um, in early childhood in Romania. Next slide, please. Since the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, looking at our expertise in working and supporting especially the professionals in early childhood, we very soon understood uh, that the professionals in early childhood will not be able to work online so much directly with the children, but mostly with their parents. So we um, put all our resources and expertise together in order to support professionals to uh, work with parents and provided um, an impressive base of educational resources that we made them available for both parents and professionals. Next slide, please. Uh, these are only um, a few examples of the uh, types of resources that we've developed. Growing up responsibly is a step-by-step -step guide to uh, uh, increasing the uh, independence and autonomy of uh, children so they can be um, happy both in the services and um, at home. And the guide uh, brought together uh, types of activities that could be supported by parents at home, uh, starting um, and with a good focus on protecting personal health and uh, safety. And it also uh, can be used by uh, professionals in early childhood services um, in order to um, support uh, understanding and learning in um, what we call STEAM. Next slide, please. One of the resources that was very highly appreciated by the professionals and the, um, they uh, used in supporting parents um, to work with their children um, when they were at home during the pandemic um, was uh, 50 ideas for learning, distance learning for preschool children. Um, and without expecting that parents will uh, become professionals overnight, we develop these resources um, in order for parents to engage in learning activities um, at home and uh, be able to uh, use the recommendations that uh, the professionals from the services their children were attending were giving to them. Next slide, please. Starting from um, a very um, important resource that is made available through the International Step-by-Step -Step Association, um, a very uh, strong network that uh, the Step-by-Step -Step Center is uh, a member of, uh, learning activities from very young children. We have developed um, a collection of activities for both uh, children six months to 36 months and preschool children three to six years. Um, that was made available uh, both in um, on, both online and in a printed edition uh, for parents to um, use the available resources and materials in the home and uh, engage in dialogue and um, activities that will with their children that will support uh, uh, learning and growth covering all areas of development. And it also had um, a focus on physical development and health and personal hygiene, were with, which were very important, um, especially during the, um, the pandemic. Next slide, please. We have also developed a collection of 25 videos based on the, uh, the most famous stories adapted to young children that each parent could uh, listen to with, together with the children. And each story was um, associated with a set of questions that uh, could stimulate uh, dialogue um, and critical thinking and 
um, supported parents to start the dialogue and um, also um, support um, engaging in creating activities with their children in the house um, using uh, whatever materials were available um, in the house. Next slide, please. We also have um, had a lot of activities. Uh, we also had a lot of activities that we developed um, in order to support the um, professionals, the teachers in the um, in the um, early childhood services and also in the step-by-step -step preschool and primary school classrooms. And we got together uh, the expertise from uh, the teachers in our uh, network, which is a national network, and they exchanged uh, resources and experiences um, so they could learn from, uh, from one another. Next slide, please. We also, um, we also adapted to the condition of the pandemic, um, the activities um, that we developed um, in the step-by-step -step preschool and primary school classrooms. Um, it would be great if we could have the PowerPoint back, Amanda. Yes, sorry, my, let me show you. It was, um, uh, it was uh, attention paid to the diversity of the local situation um, <clears throat> and it was encouraged um, the dialogue with the parents and the involvement of the parents. <clears throat> so both the uh, principles and values of the step-by-step -step alternative to be kept while um, everybody was uh, safe. Um, and um, they both, the, the teams of teachers together with the parents and the local activities were very flexible and creative uh, so that they continue to, uh, they continue to work in the, um, in the step-by-step -step alternative uh, without giving up to its values. Uh, we also followed the, Next slide, please. We also follow the same principles in the two um, educational institutions that we, um, as an NGO, established. Uh, there are two nonprofit entities organized as social enterprises, is a preschool and a primary school, um, and also the same um, the same resources were made available and teachers in these two um, entities were part of the community um, of learning and exchange and contributed with lessons learned and experiences. Next slide, please. The safety measures were um, and uh, rules were made um, accessible to children with the, these two uh, funny heroes that um, uh, went with children throughout the, the pandemic and um, all their learning experience. Uh, and we also developed in both uh, kindergarten and school uh, the educational plans assisted by uh, technology, the technology assisted learning program, which was also made available for parents so that they can support their learning experiences the, uh, of their children um, at home and also um, allowed teachers to be connected with children, developed activities, and also um, the teachers stay connected with the parents and the parents were able to stay connected with the, with the two schools. Um, next slide, please. Um, another type of activities that we uh, developed was um, Bambi step-by-step -step kindergarten was a center of interest for foreign professionals. It was also an activity that was um, facilitated uh, by uh, the International Step-by-Step -step Association. It was organized at the, of the, at the request of ACES uh, and the virtual events were part of the continuous training um, um, program of the professionals in Singapore and the Association for Early Childhood Educators in Singapore um, organized these visits um, and um, we um, uh, hosted these virtual visits uh, where we explained what we are doing in, uh, in Bambi. Next slide, please. 
So we had video presentations of the activities that were um, organized in uh, Bambi kindergarten, in group rooms, examples of good practices. We answered uh, questions um, and we uh, have uh, these interactive activities with, um, with the participants. Next slide, please. We have partnership with um, corporate um, organizations in um, Romania that um, enabled our emergency intervention during the, the pandemic. Um, and we, this is how we were able to develop uh, the, the program together online, powerful offline, um, to support the learning uh, in isolation or distance for, as I mentioned, for both professionals um, and parents, because we have uh, uh, we have the expertise of, of working and supporting um, professionals in early childhood and primary school education, uh, and we nurture a, a very big um, community of learning. Next slide, please. So we reached in 2020 and 2021 over uh, 3,500 participants in the online training courses that we um, supported and uh, organized. Um, we have a network of national trainers with which we provided all these, uh, all these trainings on different uh, topics, uh, STEAM education, observation and data recording, indoor and outdoor game, and also um, supporting the professionals to work with parents and help them organize the uh, activities um, at home, the learning activities um, at home. Um, and uh, we also um, engaged the professionals in uh, the development of the uh, support materials that were uh, made available to all the um, members of our, um, of, of our network. Next slide, please. Another type of intervention that we developed as a result um, of the shortage of um, early childhood services was piloting the complementary services for early childhood education, uh, which were called Primo Hubs. Primo Hubs were um, services developed for children from 18 months to six years old um, as a result um, of a project that we uh, developed in uh, 22 communities in two counties in Bucharest, part of the uh, one of our projects developed in partnership with UNICEF, International Step-by-Step -Step Association, and with financial support from the Jacobs Foundation and the Bodnar Fund Foundation, um, based on the on a Swiss methodology called Primo Kids. Primo Kids aims at systemic change at city and community level, and we uh, focused on uh, this part participatory process at the community level in all these 22 community uh, communities in order to support them to develop um, local strategies for um, better early childhood services. Um, in uh, this Primo Hubs, we uh, promoted playful parenting. Um, parents have access to different types of resources, uh, interaction with children, children participate in um, educational activities, uh, and professionals facilitate also um, interaction of children and participation of parents and children in, uh, in these activities. And um, one last, we will stay with this slide, uh, one last, um, very important um, activity that we were involved uh, together with UNICEF was the Bebo app, which is um, uh, an app developed by uh, UNICEF with national partners, um, starting from the idea that each and every child needs nurturing and nutrition and loving care and good health uh, and uh, a stimulating and safe environment that offers plenty of support for learning. Um, UNICEF developed um, an app that is called Bebo, uh, which was um, adapted with national partners. And in For Romania, we were the national partner, um, which uh, adapted the, um, the app to the national context. 
um, and Bebo app appeared because COVID-19 pandemic um, showed us that we need solutions to support parents uh, with timely and quality guidance. And this is what Bebo does, provides uh, information for parents um, in the fields of early learning, health, nutrition and breastfeeding, responsive parenting, protection and safety and well-being of parents. Um, the, <clears throat> the, the app Thank you, is- Thanks, uh, If you could sorry? try to- Oh, if you could try to wrap it up so we can um, make sure- Yes, I will. Uh, the, app is, uh, the app is available um, in 14 languages. Um, it gives parents uh, opportunity to, um, to get information um, from um, suggested daily reads uh, for their children. They also get information on parenting tips for playing with, uh, with their children. Uh, they also get information and they have a child development tracker so they can follow the progress of their child. They also get information about the vaccination and uh, it's, uh, each, um, in, for each language that the app is developed, there is the national vaccination plan that it is uh, embedded in the app. It's also the child's health checkups uh, and the growth tracker. And what it is important, it is that it is a free app that the parents can introduce the, uh, the, the age of their children. They can, if they have more than one children, they can uh, introduce the, the ages of all children and the app will provide the information um, in all the fields adapted to the age of the child. So for each child, the parents will know um, what are the milestones that they uh, need to follow. Uh, they will have article, video articles and written articles and also um, activities that they can engage uh, into with their children. So in a way that uh, supports development, growth and learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, that was a great presentation and great to hear about the work that's going on in Romania. Uh, without further ado, I will go over and hand over to our next presenters, Vidya and Shreya from Results for Development. Vidya is Associate Director of Education for Results for Development, and Shreya is an early childhood consultant. With them. So I'll go ahead and let them share their presentation. And we are running a little bit short on time. Apologies for that. Um, so we might run over on time a little bit. Um, and hopefully we'll still have enough time for some questions and answers. Thank you, Amanda. Is my presentation visible and clear? Yes, it is. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Shreya, and I'm here with my colleague Vidya from Results for Development, presenting uh, on behalf of our larger teams at both Results for Development and the Bernard Van Lier Foundation, who are, who are partnered to produce this study. Uh, we're really excited to be here to present a brief overview of a global landscape review we conducted on digital tools to support early childhood development. And over the next few minutes, we will talk through the objectives, rationale, methodology we employed in the study, as well as present some emerging findings uh, from the study. So to begin, um, in collaboration with the Bernardia Foundation, our team at Results of Development undertook a global landscape analysis of digital tools for early childhood development. And we had a specific focus on tools that, that were used to support parents, caregivers, and the early childhood workforce, especially in low and middle income countries. Uh, the objective of the study was to answer three broad research questions. The first being, what types of, what types of technology enabled tools exist, exist to support parents, caregivers of children age zero to five globally, as well as to support the early childhood workforce? Uh, the second being, what are the key objectives and features of these tools? And finally, what are the current practices, success factors, and challenges in the design, implementation, and dissemination of these tools? Uh, while we speak about speak to this in more detail in just a couple of minutes, I did want to clarify that when we say tools, we are essentially talking about a broad range of digitally enabled approaches, and this could include things like mobile apps, chatbots, text messaging programs, to name a few. Uh, also, given that this field is really vast, I also did want to highlight that through this exercise, what we're really hoping to do is to provide a representative overview of the key characteristics, trends, and gaps in the field uh, to various stakeholders of interest, including policymakers, donors, practitioners, and other researchers. 
Uh, now to speak to um, the, why there was a need for the study, I think it's evidence just by the interest and participation in this webinar, as well as from the great presentations you've seen so far, uh, we know the digital tools have become increasingly prevalent in supporting early childhood development globally. Uh, things like increased mobile phone penetration and connectivity, as well as the availability and quality of new, new digital technologies have, have the potential to reach a wider audience, uh, improve access to services, as well as improve quality of support to young children. These tools also have seen, have seen to have the potential to complement and reduce the burden of labor and resource intensive in-person parenting programs. They can equip caregivers with accessible evidence-based information right at their fingertips and can also support uh, the early childhood personnel with service delivery. Further, the COVID-19 pandemic has also just generated greater interest in to explore the potential of these of digital solutions to support child development. And while there's some emerging evidence in this field, the use of technology for early childhood development specifically has not been as well documented when compared to other areas like primary and secondary education. Uh, and this essentially just presented a need and opportunity to systematically understand the possibilities and limitations presented by digital tools. So with this in mind, uh, our team at Results for Development uh, is essentially, and Bernard Valley Foundation are essentially developing two key knowledge products. The first being an interactive database of 23 digital tools with detailed tool profiles. And this database will be filterable across a range of categories such as age, ECD focus areas, target audience, geographic region, um, technology components to name a few. And the second product is a short synthesis report that highlights the success factors, challenges, and lessons learned in the design, implementation, and, dis and dissemination of these tools to support early childhood development. Um, the report is also accompanied by four thematic case studies on areas that were identified as enabling factors to support these tools, which includes things like partnerships, monitoring and evaluation, cultural adaptation, and user engagement strategies. And we, all, we also use these case studies to elucidate our, our findings further. Now to speak briefly through um, the methodology that we employed to conduct the study, uh, the first thing we did was to identify and develop, uh, uh, the first thing we did was to identify the tools that we wanted to include in the study. And this was done, um, and this was essentially done through um, contacting, um, you know, the, I'm sorry, I just realized, yeah, so the first thing we did was to identify the tools for the study and through an existing, uh, through, through a desk review and existing on, on the existing literature, as well as an open call to, to various, uh, across various ECD platforms, including Bernard Van Leer's partner networks, we identified more than a hundred tools. These tools were then screened and shortlisted based on predetermined inclusion criteria, such as whether they were currently in use, uh, the availability of data, the target audience amongst others. We also paid particular attention to tools with a focus on reaching vulnerable populations and also tools that showed potential for scale. And finally, also made efforts to ensure that our shortlist reflected a diversity in easily focused areas, uh, the regions that were active in, the type of technology used to ensure that it was a representative list of the types of digital tools currently available to support early childhood. Uh, once we had uh, once we had um, the, the, the list of tools, the next step was to really do a deep dive into these shortlisted tools and gather more data on various areas like the objective, the user engagement strategies employed, dissemination strategies, partnerships inculcated, among others. We also took a more detailed, uh, we also did a more detailed desk review through various sources, such as the tools websites, the reports, their blogs, uh, among others, and also conducted key informant interviews with the tool developers to fill in any research gaps and also gather information on the tool success factors, challenges, and lessons learned along the way. In addition to learning more about the tools itself, we also did conduct a broader literature review to understand the landscape on the use of digital tools in early childhood development, and also consulted with key experts, just program managers, investors, and researchers to really understand the current state of the field. Uh, so with that background, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague Vidya, who will talk through some of the emerging findings from the study. Thanks so much, Shreya. Um, and if we can move to the next slide. One of the first things we did as part of our report analysis and development of this database of tool profiles was to 
try to understand some of the common cat common patterns across our sample. Um, and one of these areas was the types of support in terms of the focus and function of the tools. Um, so you'll see on this list some of the most common types of support that we found, um, which included sharing, sharing parenting tips and resources, enabling connection across users, for example, whether through direct messaging and, and, group, ch and group chats, um, providing advice directly from experts, making referrals to service providers and tracking different milestones. And so, and then also for the tools that were more workforce facing, we saw those which supported program implementation as well as those that um, helped in providing some kind of training. And moving to the next slide, another area that we analyzed was re related to the primary type of technology that was leveraged. Um, just to give you a sense of what we found and then focused on, and sure I referenced this a little bit earlier um, in describing kind of what we mean by tools. Um, these include apps, audio, video-based tools. And so by that, we mean those that might um, use video conferencing software or rely on phone calls. Um, also text message-based tools, um, text-based chatbots. Um, and these are, are these utilize particular algorithms to trigger a response based on user input, learning management systems for courses, um, and resource pages or databases in, for example, online platforms. Um, so this is these these two examples hopefully give you a better sense of the kinds of things that we were looking at for each of the tools. Um, but we looked at a number of other areas, including focus within um, the nurturing care framework, the particular age range targeted, special considerations for vulnerable populations, and on all of that, um, you'll ultimately be able to find in each of the tool profiles once the database launches. Um, next, I just wanted to share a few of the key themes that came up across our research on tools. And this is based um, on our, anal our analysis um, of the sample of tools that we looked at, um, the desk review that we con conducted and the conversations that we had both with tool developers as well as experts um, in the field. Uh, and one of the, the the thing one of the topics that came up frequent, frequently was the importance of keeping users engaged. Um, there are often high drop off rates with these tools. So we heard from developers about a number of strategies that are commonly employed um, to maintain interest. And this includes customizing content, providing nudges and reminders, using different progress trackers and encouraging sharing throughout someone's um, social networks. Um, and as an example, the, the Parent Education Program in Jordan, this is a program that, a, a tool that we included in the database um, that use, utilizes a Facebook Messenger-based chatbot to reach mothers with content related to their children's learning. And so one of the ways in which this tool tries to engage users and, and keep them connected is through weekly quizzes, a user progress tracker, reminders to complete modules, and also a completion certificate for different modules that are available. And then moving to the next slide, another area that we explored was the role of in-person and human interaction in combination with uh, the use of these digital tools. Um, there's some emerging evidence and experience, and we've heard a little bit um, about some of, some of that in some of the other presentations, is that these tools don't work in a vacuum and that in-person support can really su really facilitate uptake as well as um, greater engagement. Um, so as an example, Mom Connect, this is a WhatsApp-based chatbot um, in South Africa that reaches pregnant and new mothers. Um, and there we saw an example of, of, of this utilization of in-person support. So, um, so in, in, in this case, users are encouraged to sign up during antenatal visits um, and a focal person in each of the provinces works with public health centers to support this recruitment. So um, there is uh, in-person and human interaction that, that helps to promote uptake of, of the tool and, and um, greater engagement. Um, and then lastly, another theme that we wanted to touch on that came up was around sustainability and 
we heard a lot from from developers that the costs of running these tools are not insignificant and some sometimes that's forgotten and there's a need to think about how the tools can be sustained over time um, things like translation monitoring and evaluation and training those are all still an important part of, um, of of running these tools and they might not be apparent um, superficially um, so some tools work with governments they collaborate with different partners um, to reduce costs and to, to help um, facilitate some sustainability um, and for, for example one one pro one tool and program that we we looked at was um, the Jamini um, which is which is a digital community health program in Zanzibar and it utilizes an app for community health volunteers and supervisors and, and there's a strong partnership between the Ministry of Health, um, DTRI and Medic, which has facilitated the scale up of this tool in all 11 districts in Zanzibar. And there's also um, a gradual transition plan in place for the government to take on greater ownership in terms of the financial, um, programmatic and, and, and technological pieces. Um, so just to say that these were just a few kind of emerging insights and findings from from the report and from 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 this work. Um, I hope you'll stay tuned for for the full report. Um, and we're launching the database as well as the report that accompanies it um, this July. Um, and we will be able to share details and a sign up soon and we hope to, to see many of you there and um, to be able to, to share more at that point. Um, but 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 um, I think feel free to um, reach out um, with any questions in the meantime you can contact me um, other members of our team including um, Laura Ochoa at the Bernard Van Leer Foundation um, with any questions. Um, so thank you very much uh, and I think I'll pass back to Amanda. Yes, thank you so much, Shreya and Vidya. Now, I know we're running very short on time. I did want to briefly hand over to Andrea Hernandez Ariago, who's from the Lego Foundation, a program manager who's joining us to speak. Um, maybe you could just speak for a minute or two, Andrea, and then we'll hand over to our closer, Jamie Lachman from the University of Oxford. Perfect. Thank you very much. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for inviting us and inviting um, our colleagues in Telfund to talk. So I heard that you already know what we're working with Telfund, but the idea behind us as uh, Lego Foundation funding, uh, the first program that we funded was in Telfund Guatemala. And the idea was how do we reach parents through these remote modalities in COVID, during COVID, because we really wanted parents to have the quality information that they uh, that Chalfin did in that program. And then afterwards, um, we were still in COVID and then we we funded the same organization, Chalfin, to adapt it in Mexico. And then afterwards, we funded again Chalfin so that they could bring those, uh, those learnings into Brazil, uh, Honduras, Ethiopia, and Uganda. And what we learned in the LEGO Foundation is that we can keep working with the same organization. We can keep working sort of with like the same uh, content, but just adapting it to a country. And that has worked really well. Like our partnership with Telefon has, has grown from one country office to six country offices in the past three years. And it has been all around the same sort of project. And it has been a, a huge learning um, project and, and, and funding for us, but it has also supported health and offices to work together and collaborate together around the same modality of intervention. So this is what I wanted to share. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, and now I'm turning over to Jamie to close us out from the University of Oxford. Thanks everyone. I know we're already at time, but um, thank you for sticking on if you're able to. Thanks, Amanda. Um, and I will keep my remarks short because people have to jump to someone someplace else. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to close this uh, webinar. Um, so, so exciting to see all of the emerging technologies and learning and lessons that we're finding from uh, across the world around how we can improve access to evidence-based uh, digital 
uh, early childhood development, parenting support. Um, when we look across the, the landscape, we, we know that access to digital and hybrid modalities is rapidly growing. And some of these examples today are great demonstrations of this in the work that um, the Lego Foundation and Bernard Van Leer Foundation and others have been supporting. Um, and we, we know from emerging evidence that um, digital and hybrid and remote delivery programs can have shown to demonstrate positive effects. Um, and sometimes as, as good as in person, um, but more than 20 randomized control trials showing this. The problem is, is that we have very limited evidence uh, in the low and middle income countries. And some of that evidence is also suggesting that remote delivery may not be the most effective and by and large, this is due to low engagement. Um, and so some of the emerging work that we need to look at and, and to focus on with as, as researchers and innovators, the technology and the innovation is going, but we need to now start really trying to catch up when it comes to the evidence generation. Um, and But what we have seen in recent studies is that these hybrid approaches show more promise, and some studies even done in South Africa and elsewhere have shown equivalent impact in comparison with face-to-face -face and in-person approaches when you combine a remote and an in-person de delivery. And we've been also, colleagues of mine and others have been at the part of the Global Parenting Initiative, have shown benefits of external and in, in combining external and internal components to improve engagement. So if I would like make a call for areas where we need to put energy in for uh, future research, it's more along the si lines of optimizing user engagement, continuing to test those components that are internal, like the gamification and person of a, personalization, but also external, the different kind of in-person or remote support that can support a digital technology um, to build the evidence of testing these uh, solutions in low resource settings and examining differential effects for in vulnerable populations and those who may not have generally access to in-person programs, but also those who might not have access to digital programs. Um, really important to also look at how can we combine digital parenting and ECD support with other content like intimate partner violence prevention, financial literacy, education, and other um, programs and how can those be integrated within other services so they're embedded and institutionalized and taken to scale and this kind of comes to our last the call for research around learning together and applying implementation research to the science of scale up and how we can work with policymakers and implementers and parents and children to learn more about what happens when these digital and hybrid tools go to scale. So I'm really looking forward to the next webinar where maybe we'll be sharing even more learnings across the network and thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you to all of our panelists, for everyone who asked questions. We'll be sharing the recordings and presentations after this. Um, I know we went a little bit over time, so thanks to everybody who stuck around until the very end. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.